Hey, so it should be streaming. We're all set up. We're getting ready to go. about to start right now. All right, thanks. Bye. Good morning. Uh, my name is Josh Lowry. I'm the Assistant District Attorney here in Shasta County. Uh, this morning we're here to uh, provide conclusions, findings on the officer involved shooting from J uh, July 17th uh, this year in Anderson, California. Um, at first, uh, I'm going to go ahead and speak. Uh, after I speak, Sheriff Pasenko is going to come up, and he's going to uh, speak next. And then we're going to go ahead and run a short uh, video clip that you'll see is already queued up um, on the screen to my right. Um, after that, uh, we'll be available for questions, and feel free to ask uh, any question you think is appropriate at that time. Good morning. First, I'd like to thank Chief uh, Paletti and his office for their professional work in this investigation. The Reading Police Department was the lead investigative agency, which prepared many of the reports that I have reviewed uh, before this morning. On July 17, 2013, at approximately 6.14 in the morning, officers from the Anderson Police Department responded to a domestic violence call that involved a male suspect with a firearm. That suspect was John Sebastian Snyder. Snyder had beaten his female victim, leaving her bruised and bloody. The victim was able to escape her apartment only when Snyder left her momentarily in search of a shotgun that was kept in the apartment. One can only speculate what Snyder may have done to the victim had she not seized this fortuitous moment to escape him. This was not the first time Snyder had beaten this, this victim. He had attempted to kill her by strangulation on numerous occasions. He had held her at gunpoint, beat her, punched her in the stomach while she was pregnant, threatened to kill the same child after she was born, and shot and killed both of her dogs. On one occasion, the victim described Snyder in this manner when he was holding a shotgun to her head. He gritted his teeth, his eyes were black and blank, and he spoke in a low voice when he threatened to kill her and her young daughter, who was sleeping in the room next door. Back to the events of July 17th, Snyder, armed and now alone in the apartment, since the victim has escaped, barricaded himself in that apartment. The Shasta County SWAT team was alerted and responded to the scene due to the danger Snyder posed to citizens and law enforcement officers. The SWAT team began evacuating neighbors from nearby apartments. The SWAT team also attempted to contact Snyder, who reacted by appearing in the front window of the apartment, brandishing a handgun. Snyder then moved away from the window, only to return very quickly with a shotgun, which he began firing at law enforcement officers. In response, seven officers returned fire, striking and killing Snyder. Snyder's actions left the officers with no choice but to defend themselves and others. Therefore, there is no doubt that the officers acted in a manner that was reasonable and justified under California law when they returned fire and killed John Sebastian Snyder. At this point in time, Sheriff Basenko will provide a few words. Thank you.
morning, Tom Basenko, Shess County Sheriff. On July 17, 2013, Shess County Sheriff's deputies and deputies who comprised the SWAT team responded to the 3200 block of Briarwood Drive in Anderson to assist Anderson Police Department with the arrest of John Snyder. As SWAT team members were approaching the apartment in an armored vehicle, they were immediately fired upon by Snyder. Deputies returned fire in defense of their lives and protection of other lives. Snyder received multiple fatal gunshot wounds. The Sheriff's Office conducted a separate <coughs> internal administrative review of the incident. The review applies to the Sheriff's Office rules and regulations regarding the use of deadly force, and a copy of the use of force regulations is available for the media. Deputies may use deadly force to protect themselves or others against what they believe is an imminent threat of death or serious bodily injury. Each of the involved deputies made an independent decision to return fire in defense of themselves and others. Each of the deputies are tenured and well-trained. The taking of a life is a serious decision and it's never an option that law enforcement wants to pursue. However, there are occasions that when officers have no other choice and this was one of those occasions. This officer involved shooting was within Sheriff's Office policy and have you heard from the Assistant District Attorney within the law. I'm very grateful for the strong and ongoing working relationship between law enforcement agencies here in Shasta County. I'd like to thank Chief Paletti and his officers for being the lead investigative agency. And they were assisted by uh, Sheriff's Office deputies, Anderson Police, District Attorney investigators, and the California Highway Patrol. Working together, a comprehensive, complete, and objective investigation was conducted for the review, review by the District Attorney's Office. I want to thank all their agencies and their staff for the assistance in the investigation. I'm very thankful that all the officers survived this life-threatening incident. I commend the deputies for their action and the performance of their duties, and all officers have returned to duty. Uh, now, uh, Assistant District Attorney Josh Lowry, he'll uh, bring up a video and this video is uh, from the surveillance system at the apartment complex. Lights. Lights. Is this too dark for you, media? Or is it okay? Do you want the one light on? You tell me. Works for me. Yeah, I'm fine. Yeah. Okay. And we can run it more than once if that's yeah. definitely beneficial. You'll see a um, Humvee come up to the right of the screen that has some SWAT officers in it. And then to the left of the screen, upper left, you'll see an armored vehicle approach <coughs> that has officers in it as well. And then watch around the front of the Humvee. You'll see a muzzle blast occur shortly. And then also watch the grass area, you'll see the grass kick up. There's one muzzle blast. And then you saw the dirt kick up, and then the officers are returning fire at this time. The question was, was that a diversionary device that was thrown and that the answer is no. That was a small remote uh, camera that was uh, thrown into the apartment area there.
look to the left of that tree on the ground, you'll see that um, grass and dirt kick up when the uh, suspect fires on the officers in the armored vehicle. <coughs> Chair, I think we should play it one more time and okay. have everyone focusing on the front of the, uh, the darker vehicle. Uh, you may be able to see the actual impact from the first uh, the first round going off and uh, striking that vehicle. But you have to look closely. It's so watch for the first shot when it comes out and fires at the uh, black armored vehicle coming in. <coughs> There is a, an officer, a SWAT officer, in the top roof area in a turret in that uh, SWAT vehicle as well. The black one. The black one coming in at you now. If you watch the grill area, you'll see the impact. <coughs> Chef, would you like to explain the exhibits from your investigation? Absolutely. My name is Lieutenant Wallace, uh, Jeff Wallace with the Reading Police Department. I oversee our investigations division. Uh, the exhibits on, on the whiteboard are crime scene photos from the actual event. Uh, in, in the top left, you'll see the black armored rescue vehicle that, that pulled up and was ultimately uh, shot by Mr. Schneider. Uh, the second photograph is the grill area where, as demonstrated in the video, you could see the actual impact. Uh, the shotgun shells were fired were double odd buck shotgun shells, which have depending upon the, the shell itself, between 9 and 12 32 caliber pellets that are fired. Uh, and the armored vehicle was struck with approximately 13 uh, pellets. 
You can see an impact in the third photo. This is on a rear door that was open on the armored vehicle. So the rear of the vehicle sustained one strike, and the majority of the rounds that struck the vehicle were focused on the, the front grille area. Uh, a side view of the same armored vehicle. The top middle photo, you can see an overhead uh, video taken by CHP of the, of the scene itself, uh, the layout of the apartment complex and, and the positioning of the armored car and the, the Humvee. The middle photo is the window that Mr. Schneider uh, chose to commit his attempted murder on the deputies. That's where he was standing when he began firing at them. An internal photo of the residence after the shooting shows a Benelli shotgun that he used uh, in his attempt to shoot the deputies as well as a handgun that he had in his possession, which was used during the assault of this domestic violence victim. He actually savagely beat her about the head with this handgun, uh, causing some pretty significant injuries to her head. Several blocks from the original scene of the shooting during the investigation, we located Mr. Schneider's vehicle, which was staged several blocks away. Uh, inside that vehicle, we found a backpack that contained uh, numerous items, uh, such as another handgun, a stun gun, metal knuckles, uh, knives, duct tape, additional <coughs> ammunition contained in the backpack. He also contained in his vehicle a bulletproof uh, ballistic vest, uh, personal body armor, a gas mask, and a second uh, loaded handgun. Do you mind if I ask, were these weapons owned legally? He's a convicted felon, so he was a felon in possession of firearms. Any of them stolen? Um, yes, I, I believe one of the handguns was stolen. <clears throat> How many rounds is that clip in that shotgun, or is, or is that just a, that's just a, a grip, or is that a magazine in the shotgun? Yeah, it's a pistol grip shotgun, so you have the stock and a, and a pistol grip for your hand. Um, it's, it's a standard uh, legal shotgun that would hold, you know, three to five rounds in the magazine. Uh, do we know how many shots um, was, the, the suspect fired three shots from the shotgun, correct? correct. Uh, do you know how many shots were fired by officers when they returned fire? There was 88 rounds fired in response. Uh, do you know how many of those actually hit the suspect? Um, according to the autopsy report, there were five identifiable bullet strikes on the suspect's body. However, there were other injuries and difficult to determine the exact number of strikes on his body due to a couple different factors. One of those factors would be that some of the gunshot wounds cause significant damage. They're, they're rifle rounds, so they cause significant damage on the suspect, which in those injuries you could sustain a couple bullet strikes and not be able to determine actually how many hit in that area. Also, with him being behind um, somewhat of a, a barrier of, of glass and blinds and door frames, window frames, that stuff is falling apart when rounds are hitting it, and some of that stuff, broken glass and things, are hitting the suspect as well. So you have that type of falling effect on the suspect. So an actual exact number count was very difficult for them to determine, but there was an identifiable five and additional injuries. Were the, the uh, SWAT team members firing AR-15? Uh, they were firing 223 caliber rifles. Any other questions? Uh, immediately following this incident, uh, were the officers involved put on some sort of leave or anything like that? I'd refer that to Sheriff Simpson. Yes, they were. Usually that's for a little bit of decompression time, mm -hmm. uh, the investigation, the initial investigation, and then the officers have a debriefing with a psychiatrist. Uh, what? And they were all returned to work. Uh, do you know the time frame, like how long they were on leave when they returned to work? Uh, it was several days, but I don't know the exact number of days. Did he have active warrants? He did. He did. He had an outstanding felony warrant that was a $500,000 bail for assault with a deadly weapon and terrorist threats. He also had a, he was a subject of a domestic violence restraining order prohibiting him from contacting this victim at the time of this event. And then even without him being a convicted felon, which is not supposed to have guns, the restraining order would also prohibit him from having guns legally also. Do we know anything about the narrative of, of, I mean, with the restraining order, how he ended up in this apartment? Was he there, basically was the woman allowing him to be there and it, things got out of hand or? 
Do we know if he you know, just showed up and made his way in the apartment kind of thing? Our understanding is he was other one of them. All right, any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. Hey, Steve. Never over till the lab barks. <laughs> I said, are we clear? I was leaving this thing going so it didn't cut off. I don't know what kind of lag we have going on.